Holy Nihilism, The Moral and Spiritual Case Against Christianity, by C.B. Robertson, read by the author. Do not love the world, or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. 1 John 2, 15-17 Introduction My purpose is not to proselytize. I have no interest in harassing those who have chosen a path and are happily set in their beliefs. If the reader finds the argument I propose compelling, I urge them not to go and thrust it upon their Christian acquaintances. As much as I enjoy debates, I have found that arguing with the unwilling is not only frustrating and fruitless, but tasteless. I hope that the persuaded reader will not poorly represent my purpose by violating this request. My opposition to pushiness should not be construed as unseriousness about this subject. This is a book about spirituality and not about politics although there are certainly political implications. While pushiness may be considered by some as an effective means to some end in the realm of politics, there is no way to separate means from ends in the world of spirituality. Christianity is about the development of a particular spirit, which is to say, a particular character, and the means which any spiritual system advocates for its own propagation become habits of its disciples. These habits, in turn, forge a portion of those disciples' character. Thus, there is no way to be pushy without becoming a pushy person. Obnoxious, insecure, and distracted from personal achievement by the compulsion to influence others. I am not persuaded by the arguments for political expediency. Such pushiness is often counterproductive. But I also believe that there is no need to push for an idea whose time has come. Perhaps it is time for this kind of criticism of the faith, and perhaps it is not. But in either case, pushing against the disinterested and the closed off will not accomplish anything. In my experience, it is more likely to simply foul up relationships. My intended audience is not the legions of faithful. If some of them happen to enjoy this work, all the better. But my target is someone different. My reader is one who sees the trajectory of society and does not like it. They see an increasing isolation and separation, and perhaps this is most visible in our technology. New technology is sleek and impenetrable, hopelessly complex and seemingly driven by magic. We cannot hope to understand it all. The best most of us will be able to manage is to buy the newest models. This modern technology is a great gift, but a part of this gift can be a feeling of helplessness and dependence as well as a profound disconnection from others. Beyond the direct experience of the technology itself, this technology provides almost limitless connectivity with an equally limitless number of people. There is less reason to invest in any one relationship, because there are plenty of other fish in the sea. With the internet and transportation being what they are, the sea just got a whole lot wider. There is plenty of escape from our family, and the problems that inevitably arise from prolonged proximity to other human beings. There is plenty of escape from reality, so long as you can push away the thought that there is also no escape from being watched. This brave new world is a confusing place. Identities are a la carte. Formerly clear categories, such as gender and nationality, are blurred in ways that seem to totter between amnesia and full-blown psychosis. The traditional stepping stones towards maturity Moving out from our parents' homes, graduating school, working a steady job, purchasing a house, getting married, having children, and so on, are becoming less common as alternative paths proliferate. But there are no benchmarks to measure how we are doing along these alternatives, or if these alternatives are even better than the older paths that were discarded. The benchmarks themselves are what have been rejected. To cope, with the helplessness and aimlessness of this void, a great number of people simply stay drugged up, alone, or both. But critically, there is also a moral dimension to this world. 
an ethos that oils the machine, and if the oil stopped, then the machine would seize and everything would stop working. Tolerance, diversity, and a kind of universalistic semblance of love seem to make it all possible. This ethos goes beyond the non-judgmentalism of the hippies. It is a kind of anti-judgmentalism, which actively seeks out formerly judged inferior because diversity mandates it, and because such an approach demonstrates tolerance and universal love. These are the religious virtues of the secular Novus Ordo Seclorum, love, tolerance, diversity, and equality. While our addictions to technology may be the most obvious expression of the pathologies of modernity, it has been enabled by this moral dimension, which was set in place long before the invention of the first computer, let alone the creation of the World Wide Web. My reader rejects the trajectory of this world. They do not like where it is going, because they do not like where it has already taken us. They want something else a different vision with different values. And so they look to the past, to the traditions that preceded the present order, for the purpose of a better life, of better relations with their friends and family, of a good marriage, of a nation they can be proud of, and a future they can believe in. Perhaps they are considering Christianity. It is a natural step to take. Christianity, after all, is the religion of our grandparents. It appears opposed to this modern order, and it offers clarity, certainty, simplicity, and a meaningful identity in an age that seems to undermine all of these things. It promises love and life instead of the anxious ambiguity of freedom. But my reader is not after simple convictions and certainty. After all, these attitudes can be held about the wonder of the globalized modern world. The imperturbable, cheery optimism that comes with simple certainties can look a lot like naivete at times, especially in the face of serious problems. If my reader is like myself, the sight of these problems and the sense that you are alone in thinking that there is a problem can be troubling and demoralizing. There's nothing more lonely than seeing something wrong, looking around and seeing only smiling faces. Denying anything is amiss. Sometimes it can be so lonely that you find yourself wishing to be stupid so that you could go back to the blissful ignorance of simple certainties. But even if you wanted to, you cannot simply re-immerse yourself in the old belief that everything is fine and wonderful. We cannot go back to that childlike state. For my reader, simplicity and certainty and clarity and identity are not enough anymore. My reader needs truth. It is to you, my reader, and not to others who have no concerns on this subject, that I offer this argument against Christianity. The choice is not between Christianity and modernity, because the destruction of identity, the degradation of relationships, and the ever-increasing monotonous flatness of life without lasting attachments that increasingly characterize modern life, all have ideological roots. In the Bible. These problems of today are not some new spiritual alternative to Christianity. They are its manifestation, and we are not even at the end of the ride. I am not so bold as to declare with certainty that my argument is definitive. I have trouble accepting that anything is definitive these days. But the interpretation I offer here is the only interpretation of the faith that satisfied me intellectually. The disturbing implications of this interpretation fell into place after arriving upon it, not because I went out searching for some reason to attack something. I believe that what I have written is true, but my hope is not that my reader will accept my position as an unquestionable and self-evident truth. It is offered but as a plausible explanation for why some things are the way they are today. This clarity is a necessary light to see a way off of our present course and, ideally, to a better path with a better destination. If you, dear reader, are as I was and remain, on the hunt for answers, for things to do and things not to do in order to live better, for explanations that make better sense of the world, and perpetually open to new ideas and new ways of viewing old doctrines, then it is for you that I have written this book.
I hope that you enjoy it and find it as stimulating in the reading as I did in the writing. And if a friend should come with doubts and questions, troubled by observations about things being backwards in the world today, worried but unsure of how or why we got here, and if perhaps religion is what has been missing in society, then, and only then, consider sharing this title. C.B. Robertson, November 13th, 2019.